All right, picking up where we left off, I'm talking about um, radioactive isotopes um, and isotopes having the different number uh, or the same number of protons but different number of neutrons uh, such as we had here. But let's come back to the subatomic particles themselves, okay? We described how these electrons are in this shell, a three-dimensional shell surrounding the nucleus, okay? And these electrons are attracted towards the positive um, charge of the neutrons in the middle, kind of the same way that the moon is attracted towards the gravity of the Earth, okay? Now, Unlike um, gravity, when we're talking about electrons, when we're talking about these electrons surrounding a nucleus, we have to understand that these electrons can have different amounts of energy, okay? So the more energy they have, the faster they can move, and the faster they can move, the further away from the nucleus they would be. Okay? But there are limitations to this, and these electrons can only exist in certain defined areas. Okay? So let's, let's explain this a little bit further. Okay? So the different energy levels of electrons. So first of all, what the heck is energy? Okay? Energy is just simply the capacity to cause change. Okay. And there are different kinds of energies. So when we are actively utilizing energy, we, or we have something moving, we refer to that as kinetic energy. Okay. Another type of energy is potential energy. Okay. Potential energy is the amount of energy that matter has because of its location or structure. Way to think of this is imagine that you have a book propped up on a table, okay? If, it, if that book falls off the table, it has the energy inherent in it to fall to the earth, okay? That energy isn't being used, but that energy still exists in that object. And the fact that it is being propped up by the table is what gives it that energy. Okay. Now, electrons can have different amounts of potential energy. And the state of this potential energy is called its energy level, or this will translate into something that we call an electron shell. Okay. This is best explained graphically. So let's take a look at a picture here. So first of all, let's just talk about potential energy real quick. Here's a ball and a set of stairs. Okay, if that ball is up on the top of the stairs, it has the inherent or potential energy to fall down. Okay, it is the stairs that is holding it up, giving it that energy, but that energy is there. If this ball is rolling and it falls down the stairs, you can see that it would have one level of potential energy here, that some of that energy would be converted to kinetic energy and be used to move it down to this next lower stair. But at that point, you have a new potential energy. That potential energy is less than it was up here, but you still have it. Okay. Again, we might use some of that potential energy, burn it off as kinetic energy to move it. Again, energy is the ability to, to cause change. So we're changing and we're moving down here to this third stair. And when it's here, it still has potential energy to fall down to here, but this amount of potential energy is less than it was up here, and it's less than it was up here. Okay. Now, electrons behave the same way, okay? It can exist in a shell surrounding the nucleus, 
at its lowest energy level, it could gain energy by absorbing it and jump up to either another shell or maybe it would jump up two shells, okay? And once it's up here, it has a higher level of potential energy. That potential energy can be spent and drop it back down to these lower shells, okay? And that energy being spent uh, would lower the amount of potential energy and fall down to the next lower shell and maybe even back down to its lowest energy shell. Okay. Now, similar to a ball on steps, this ball can't exist halfway in between this step and this step, right? It's either on this step or it's on this step or it's on this step or it's on the ground. Okay, there's no in-between. Electrons have the same type of scenario, okay? While you don't have a physical barrier you can see, there are properties in the electron, which means that it can exist here, it can exist here, or it can exist here. But it cannot exist lower than here, or in between these two levels, or in between these two levels, okay? it only has certain defined energy levels that it can hold, okay? If you want to go into why this is, take chemistry, okay? Or come sit down, talk with me, I'm happy to chat about that, okay? But again, that's kind of above our pay grade for right now, okay? We will go back into this topic in the, the further future, okay? Now, Something cool that kind of comes out from this is this idea of electrons gaining and losing energy and jumping shells is exactly what's happening when you look at a black light poster. Okay, This black light poster is painted with special materials that fluoresce. Okay, What fluorescence means is they are made out of a material that has electrons that are capable of absorbing energy at a particular wavelength of light. The wavelength is in the UV range of light. So a black light is a UV light bulb, okay? The human eye cannot detect black light, okay? Uh, when you look at a, a black light uh, bulb, you can kind of see a purplish glow what we are seeing is where that UV kind of spills into the purple range, okay? Because it's it's a continuum. It um, just changes color depending on how long the wavelength of light is. Again, way above our pay grade. But what's happening here is these electrons are absorbing light from the black light, okay? They're absorbing that light as energy, and then they are collapsing and releasing that energy. That released energy is lower than the amount it absorbs because nothing is 100% efficient, okay? That light that is released off is released as different colors, okay? So here we have green, here we have purple, here we have red, okay? So that is how a black light poster works. It is all about electrons absorbing energy from the black light, jumping up to higher energy shells, and then falling back down, collapsing, releasing that energy. Okay. So now that we have this idea of different energy levels, let's go back to the periodic table and start talking about how those energy levels and how these electrons are organized actually determines the chemical behavior of an atom, okay? So here is the periodic table, but again, we don't need to know about all of these, so I'm going to simplify this, okay? I'm going to limit it to the first three rows. And to make this easier, I'm going to take all of these elements and all of these elements, and I'm going to shove them together so that now we have something that looks like this. Three different rows, and we have a number of different columns here. Okay. 
So with hydrogen, it has an atomic number of one, so it has one proton, and to balance that out, when it first starts out at its ground state, it would also have one electron. Okay. Helium has two protons, so to balance it out, it will have two electrons. Okay. Now, in this first energy shell, it has a limited amount of space. And remember that these electrons are negatively charged, and they are going to be repelling each other. Okay. There's only so many electrons that you can fit into this space. Okay. So when we go up to lithium, which has three protons, and consequently will have three electrons, two of the electrons will fit into that first shell, but then there's no more room. Okay, so that third electron fits into the next shell out. That electron has more potential energy than these electrons. Okay, so we can then keep on going up here. So we have um, lithium, then we have um, all these other various elements here. So we have four protons, five protons, six protons, seven protons, eight protons, and so forth. So here we have four electrons. So we have two in the shell, and now we have two in this shell. Well, think about a sphere as it's getting bigger, because remember, you know, this is represented as a two-dimensional circle, but it exists in a three-dimensional space, okay? This has more room in it, so it actually has enough room to fit eight electrons in total. So here we have two in the first shell, two in the second shell. Over here on boron, we can move up to three in the outer shell, again, still two in the lower shell. Carbon, we have four in the outer shell. Nitrogen, we have one, two, three, four, five in the outer shell. Six in the outer shell, seven in the outer shell. And at neon, we have eight in the outer shell. Eight is the maximum that you can fit into the second shell, okay? So now when we move down the sodium, which has one more proton and consequently one more electron, that electron has to fit into the third shell because there's no space in shell one or shell two. So you keep on moving outwards, okay? As we keep on going up, we start filling this up until we reach argon, which again has eight. Eight is still the maximum amount that we can fit into this third electron shell. The fourth electron shell actually has more space in it, okay, because it is that much bigger. And consequently, when we looked at the version of this table before that had this big gap, this big gap essentially represents the fact that there is more spots where you can fit electrons, okay? And we'll explain that a little bit further here in a moment, okay? This outer shell is what interacts with the world around that atom. Consequently, it is the electrons in this outer shell which actually determines how that element is going to behave in a chemical reaction, okay, because that is what is interacting with the outside world, okay. So the outer shell we refer to as the valence shell, and this is going to determine what chemical behavior exists in that uh, element. We will pick this up in part three.